Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second session of the technical program. Uh, this session is on repair and uh, debug. And uh, the first talk will be given by Yiling Lu. And the title of the presentation is Can Automated Program Repair Refine Fault Localization? A Unified Debugging Approach. And this uh, paper also received um, an Artifacts Evaluated Functional Certificate, Artifacts Available Certificate, and also Artifacts Evaluated Reusable Certificate. Congratulations for that. And please, uh, you have the floor. Corina, just one second. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I just one announcement uh, that we are going to mute everyone and prevent. So now everybody can unmute, unmute themselves and the presenter can unmute herself and present. Thank you, sorry then for the interruption. Can, can you see the screen? Yes. Thank you for the introduction. Hi everyone, my name is Yilin from Peking University and I'm very glad to introduce our work on unified debugging. The work is mainly done when I was visiting student in UTD and it's also cooperation work with Alibaba. Well, there are always two key questions in software debugging. The first one is how to automatically localize software bugs to facilitate the manual repair. And the second one is how to magically repair them without manual intervention. And to address these two questions, there are two types of techniques known as fault localization and automated program repair. In the past decade, fault localization and automated repair have been extensively studied and so far they are connected in an inherent way. For example, in test-driven APR, given a buggy program and failing tests, Firstly, some of the shell fault localization technique would be applied to identify potential buggy locations. Second, the API will try to generate a variety of patches for all the candidate of code. And all the generated patches would be validated against the test suite and the patches passing all tests are called plausible patch. Any plausible patch that can pass the manual inspection are returned as the correct patch which are also the final outcome for APR. Although have been extensively studied, um, currently both of these techniques are quite limited effectiveness. For example, previous studies suggested that the current fault organization technique have quite limited effectiveness for manual repair in practice. And at the same time, current APR can only fix a quite small ratio of real world bugs. For example, according to recent studies, such as Liu's work on EXA 2020, out of 395 bugs in the widely used benchmark defense 4 j more than 18% of, of them cannot be successfully fixed. Even the state of the art API tool PRAPA can successfully fix only 43 bugs. So, what can we do for such a large part of unfixed bugs? Our insight in this work is to unify APR with fault localization in a bi-directional way. In other words, even the bugs that cannot be automatically fixed, we still consider their patch execution information can be very helpful for debugging. For example, there can be a large number of patches being executed during patch validation phase. For instance, uh, consider a very extreme case a patch which can pass all the tests. It indicates that the patch actually can mute the impacts of the bug, which further implies the patch and the bug may share very related locations. Since we can know the patch of the location of the patch, we can further to infer the location of the bug. For instance, there is an example from the FAST4J on the left side, there is a manual patch, and on the right side, there is a one patch generated by the state of the art API tool proper. 
Fixing this bug requires multiple lines of modification, which is actually beyond the reach of BRAPA and virtually any other existing APR tool. And in this case, even no plausible patch can be generated by BRAPA. In this table, the second column represents the spectrum-based photo localization score of each method. Since spectral technique is the only captures coverage information and rather than consider the actual impact of the code elements on test behaviors. The buggy method is only ranked at the top four, whereas the last two columns represent the execution results of originally failed and originally passed the tests on each patch. And for example, out of three or original failed tests, two of them become passed on the patch 10, leaving only one originally failed test still failed on that patch. Well, from this table, we can have some interesting findings. Uh, firstly, we find that the patches that even not the plausible ones, which positively impacts the failed tests, might indicate the potential buggy code locations. On the other hand, the patches which negatively impact the past tests might exclude the correct code locations. At the same time, we can find that the detailed number of the impacted tests does not really matter like they're not that related to the suspiciousness of code locations. And in this way, we can not only largely refine for the organization for manual repair, at the same time, we can also make APR applicable to all possible bugs, not only the bugs that can be automatically fixed. Since for those hard to fix bugs, we can still provide useful bug localization to help manual repair. We call such an idea a unified APR with fault localization to boost the boost area as unified bugging. We then propose the first unified bugging approach, ProFL, to utilize the patch execution information to refine fault localization. Now, let's quickly walk through the workflow of ProFL. Firstly, ProFL takes over the shell fault localization for the initial species calculation. For example, uh, currently we use the aggregated spectral technique with Okai formula as the initial species value of each code element. Then we enable APR with such initial fault localization scores and to collect the patch execution information based on which we design a set of simplistic feedback rules to categorize patch into different groups. For example, for a given patch, if there is at least one originally failed test become passed and no originally passed test become failed on that patch, we call it a clean fix patch. We first set priorities between these patch groups. Then in the third step, ProFL propagates the max priority of the patches to their belonging code elements. Or lastly, the final species value of each code elements are first calculated by groups. And then within each group, they are further ranked by their initial fault localization scores. Currently, we build ProFL on the top of the state of the art APR tool proper. We choose proper since it's not only effective, but also highly efficient. As it's no, patch validation is quite expensive and over including compilation, loading, and execution time. Proper can get rid of comparison time since it performs bytecode patching, and at the same time, the loading and execution are further accelerated by the on-the-fly patching. Where in this way, proper can achieve significant speed up in patching phase. But of course, ProFL can be extended to build on any other APR tool. We implement ProFL as a one-click unified bugging tool, which is applicable to popular JVM languages due to its bytecode level manipulation. And more details on ProFL can be found on our GitHub homepage if you are interested. In our study, we evaluate ProFL on the two versions of Defense4j involving 587 bugs in total. In this talk, due to time limitation, I would mainly talk about the results on version 1.2 since it's widely used in debugging research. And the results on the other version of the benchmark can be found in our paper. 
right? In the first RQ, we compare ProFL with spectrum and mutation-based photo localization techniques. In particular, for spectral technique, we used Okai formula with aggregation strategy. And for mutation-based technique, we use MUSE and Metalexis. We also compare with the hybrid approach MCBFL. And all these techniques, they are the state-of-the-art technique in their belonging category. Where overall, we can find there are significant improvements of ProFL compared to these techniques in terms of all metrics. For example, the top one value of ProFL is 161, 13 more than MCBFL, 44 more than aggregation-based spectrum, and nearly 17 more than metalaxis and MUSE. In addition, the MAR and MFR values are also significantly improved, which indicates a consistent improvement of all buggy elements in the ranked list. And currently, we use spectral-based OKI formula to compute the initial fault localization score, but in theory, it can be any spectral formula. So we first investigated the effectiveness of ProFL on all the existing 34 spectral-based formula. We implement ProFL with different formula as the initial species score calculation and present the top one and average ranking results by these two figures, whereas the light and dark lines represent the original spectral technique and our ProFL version respectively. From these figures, we can find that ProFL can consistently improve all the 34 studied spectral formula. For example, the top one value improvements range from 41 to 87, while the MAR improvements range from 36 to 77 percent. Where we can also observe the similar trends in other metrics. Besides spectra and mutation-based for localization, researchers have also proposed to utilize various different information for fault localization and recently the learning-based technique, which using such different features for fault localization are suggested to be very effective. So we further study if ProFL can boost the existing learning-based FL techniques. Here we choose the best technique of the unsupervised learning-based technique, PRFL, and the best supervised learning-based technique, DeepFL. From the table, ProFL significantly outperforms and further boosts both state-of-the-art learning-based for the localization. For example, ProFL with PRFLMA localized 185 bugs within top one. And to our knowledge, it's the best fault localization results on defense 4 without supervised learning. And actually, such unsupervised learning-based fault localization results even significantly outperform many supervised learning techniques. Or in addition, we can observe that ProFL even boosts supervised learning-based technique. Now, for example, it boosts DeepFL to localize 216 bugs within top one which is also the best for the localization results on Defense4j. So far, we have studied ProFL use four patch execution metrics. That is, the execution of each test on each patch is known. But in practical program repair, the failed tests are usually executed before past the tests. And the patch validation against a patch stops once there is the test that fails. That is to say, in practical program repair, the full patch execution matrix is usually unavailable. But instead, the partial patch execution matrix is available. So we first study the performance of ProFL with such a partial matrix. And the table above presents the full organization results with a partial matrix. And the table below lists the collection time and the number of executed tests of full and partial matrix. Firstly, from the first table, surprisingly, we can find that ProFL has no clear effectiveness drop, even with such a partial matrix. But we can say for the traditional mutation-based photo localization techniques, they perform significantly worse using such partial matrix. And at the same time, with partial matrix, 
there is almost 26 times speed up in execution time and almost over 700 reductions in the number of executed tests. Besides the evaluation on the widely used benchmark in debugging research, ProFL currently has also been deployed in the global company Alibaba with over 1 billion global users. After any test failing is triggered on the server, ProFL would be applied and then return the potential patches and or refined for the localization results to help developers debug. And currently, ProFL has been deployed in many teams in Alibaba, such as the payment and the advertisement systems. And besides the end forest, more systems are also planning to use ProFL. All these systems are of large scale, such as more than 1 million lines of code. And on these systems, ProFL is still very effective and efficient. For example, here is an industrial case of ProFL in projects from Alibaba, which is a spring-style multimodal microservice system with nearly 200,000 lines of code. Where the repair space in this bug is too large for APR2 to generate any correct patch, but after exploring nearly 3,500 patches with 48 minutes, ProFL successfully localized the buggy method as the top one while well, the traditional spectral-based technique can only localize it at 125. And we are keeping receiving seven such inspiring feedbacks from our partners in the company. And for example, the developers in Alibaba consider a large amount of their debugging time is saved by ProFL. Where in this paper, we explore the question, can automated program repair refine for the localization? And to answer this question, we propose a unified bugging approach, connecting fault localization and APR in a bi-directional way for the first time. We, all, we not only open a new dimension to advance the state of the art fault localization, and at the same time, we extend the APR to all possible bugs, not only the bugs that can be automatically fixed. We also implement our approach as a fully automated Maven plugin and also deployed to the Alipay system with over 1 billion global users. Well, thank you for your attention and any questions. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. So I would say that uh, this is really very impressive work. Congratulations for it. There are a few questions from Slack. Uh, Bach, who was supposed to be the session chair, had some technical problems, but now he is online. So he is asking, how many patches Pro PR needs to consider to evaluate to achieve a good performance on full localization? Hello. Uh, yeah, yes. And currently, currently we build Pro FL on the top of the proper and. Uh, Currently, the results is based on all the pa patch generated by the proper. Okay. So yeah, sorry, ProFL, it was about the question. And uh, uh, another comment from Rohan Padie. He says he doesn't have any questions, but he loves the key insight in ProFL. Great talk, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I can second uh, him. So thank you very much. Let's give you a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And please continue the discussion on Slack if you wish. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So now it is time for uh, our second presentation. And uh, the second talk in the repair and debug session will be given by Annibale Panicella. And the talk is about automated repair of feature interaction failures in automated driving systems. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, very well. Ah, thank you so much. So hello everybody and uh, Welcome, thanks for joining this, uh, this session. 
In this uh, work, this, so in this presentation, I'm going to uh, present our work, which is about program repair for uh, automated driving system with particular attention to interaction failures. It was a, a joint work with the uh, University of Ottawa, University of Luxembourg, and uh, IEE, which is uh, our industrial partner, and myself, I'm from Tudor uh, University of Technology. So moving to the context, what we're talking about here is uh, self-driving cars. I think everybody knows the context, but just to be sure that everybody is reading on the same page, just me give you a quick sum uh, summary. So automated driving system are cyber physical system with both uh, cyber, so uh, hardware and software components. And more importantly, these hardware sensors are in there to understand what's going on in the surrounding of the, of the car. If you look into the detail, however, there are multiple features that actually are responsible to understand the different aspects of the environment. For example, there is an automated emergency braking that is there to detect the distance with the other car in the street and eventually brake in case of uh, emergency. There's also, for example, a, a device responsible to recognize the traffic signals, including speed limits and stop signs. Um, pedestrian protection that is in there to understand, for example, what are the pedestrians around uh, on the corner of the street and lane departure warning, for example, to determine whether the car is correctly working or, for example, is uh, uh, deviating from the actual lane. So all of these devices, uh, actual features in there are actually composed of two main parts. The first part is, for example, is a sensor, mostly a camera uh, with image processing. And it's actually an autonomous feature, which is there to detect, for example, the different element of the environment. So if you think about, so we have like a vector of different features and every feature actually can be implemented in different ways. So we have some feature that are, for example, based on deep learning, other, for example, based on uh, clustering, etc. All of them are responsible to detect the element of the environment and they send actual commands to the actuator. So to determine what the car is supposed to be. For example, we have in a specific scenario, that, for example, one uh, of the feature tell that the car should break because, for example, there is a pedestrian that is crossing the street. But in the same time, we also may have another feature that tell the car to go ahead to accelerate because, for example, the traffic lights is uh, green. So in real time, there are multiple features, all of them sending contrasting actions for the car. And it's a moment to decide which of those actions needs to be uh, applied in every single time step. The role here is actually to write an integration component, which is a set of uh, rules, uh, mostly written by domain experts with also the legal department and the ethical department. They set up the, all the conditions and specify exactly which of the different uh, um, um, feature take the lead depending on a certain situation. So usually you can see the rule set as a kind of decision tree. Every node is actually a specific check being applied and the path from the root to the actual leaf is the set of rule sets to check. And at the end, the leaf is the corresponding feature that takes the lead in the car. So this is how the conflict between different features are actually uh, assessed. So once the car is actually developed, it's the moment to test the car. Uh, one theoretically easy but very expensive way is, for example, to test it on the road which is, however, can be very dangerous, but also very expensive because the hardware is expensive and very fragile. So a common practice is to test the car first through simulation-based testing. And this can be done, for example, deploying the actual software instead to the actual hardware, but to deploy with a specific simulation. So the, in this testing environment, uh, the testing input are actually the different scenarios, which include, for example, the shape of the road, the uh, position of the car, the speeds, the eventual uh, pedestrians, and traffic signs. Uh, the software then is connected to a simulation, which is pretty sophisticated, and simulate also the physics of the environment, including, for example, the friction on the road. And the output is both a videos that can be used, for example, to understand how the car would behave, but also an actual vector of states. So for every time step, we know what's the position of the car, the speed, the position of the pedestrian. So with this, it is possible also to analyze the uh, actual state step by step. So uh, we had two uh, case study from our industrial partner and both case study, which are two version of uh, driving cars, 
uh, that actually had some feature interaction failure. So these were actually designed by expert, manually tested by developer and also by domain expert. And they differ from this type of rules that have been integrated. So we can see them as two different versions that aim to address the same problem. So a uh, lead, a car. The site is about 700 uh, key uh, effective locks. And the test suite is actually pretty expensive since the simulation is in there. So the entire test suite running is about 30 minutes. For both systems, there are four, four features that are actually uh, in place. And the integration component is there to uh, determine how these two uh, interact and how to solve the conflict between these four features. There are multiple types of feature interaction failure we can think about. And basically what we want is to avoid the classical uh, accidents. For example, we know that there is a this need to be a minimum distance between our car and the ego car. And if the distance is slower than a minimum safe distance, then you definitely have a failure. We can also have an accident. So where, for example, there's a collision between our car and the uh, leading car, or for example, a collision or an accident with pedestrians. And so, for example, the car doesn't stop in case there is, a, for example, a specific traffic signs and also the speed. So the car may go faster than the actual allowed speed uh, on the road. So there are possible fa uh, failures. In our case, we focus on interaction failure, which means there are multiple uh, fa features in the same time, and the car simply make the wrong decision, and this wrong decision leads to an actual accident. So at the beginning, we try to apply a classical program repair. And here, for example, I'm giving two examples of well-established techniques, GenProg and the tool Astor. And they are, for example, mostly for uh, device, for Java code, and for classical type of libraries. The overall idea to give a very quick overview, it's basically genetic programming uh, based uh, feature the program repair. And the overall idea is to start with the faulty program and use the test suite as a contract. So we want to find a patch that satisfies that lets all test cases to pass successfully. So the idea is, for example, is to generate variants, and these variants are identified by applying feature location to determine which are the possible location of the bugs, applying mutation, for example, using crossover, is basically cutting the three, the AST in the sub trees, and apply, for example, mutation. And when the patches are generated, they are executed against the test suite, and the quality of the patch is then evaluated depending on the number of tests. So better patches those that minimize the number of uh, failing test cases. If the process continues in a loop, then we will have hopefully a patch that uh, basically is a test adequate, which means that makes all tests successfully uh, passing. So if you look into, however, into the detail, uh, there are some implicit assumptions about this technique. First of all, uh, most of uh, program repair techniques focus on one defect at a time, which means that there's assumption there is uh, some test failures, the failing test, but all of those are depending on one single defect in the actual program and their analysis. Besides, the patches usually are very minimal, so are very small, so may um, require to change few lines in the source code. And also, it is the, actually the most critical ones for us is that the test suites in traditional scenarios are very cheap. They can be executed in a fraction of seconds. So if you have to execute a test suite multiple times to evaluate multiple uh, patches, then it would take a few seconds to get the overall feedback. And finally, we also notice one uh, limitation is about the guidance for the heuristics. The fitness function to program repair mostly with some variation, but they count mostly the number of failing tests. So there is not much guidance on how far or how close is the patch in actually uh, avoiding the failure. So we actually try to look at what is, uh, whether this assumption holds for our context. And however, for our, for example, case studies, we notice that actually we have multiple defects in the same, uh, in the same system. So we have to consider this uh, new assumption. Second, we also find out that in our context, there are multiple lines that need to be changed, uh, not only a few lines. So the size of the patch is also pretty large. And most critically, the test suite is very expensive. So for each patch that we can generate, we need to wait for 30 minutes to get the results of the test suite, which make almost uh, infeasible to apply a population-based uh, or genetic programming. And finally, we also notice that in our context, we can use some more uh, faster, uh, better heuristics. And because not all failures are equal, and we can think about their intensity. 
For example, if you consider between the distance between two cars, failing the main uh, safe distance by 10 centimeters is less uh, dangerous than, for example, violating by two meters. So this concept of intensity is a, can provide an extra guidance to determine how far are we in making an actual patch. So what we proposed is a two um, uh, technique that we name aerial, which stands for automated repair of integration rules for automated driving systems, and is not the population-based genetic programming, which is pretty popular in the literature, but it's a simple one plus one evolutionary algorithm with two key ingredients. The first one it uses an archive, and I will give you some detail in the next slides. And there's also a many objective algorithm where each objective is actually one of the uh, failing assertions. And the value of the objective is the intensity of the failure itself. So this is the uh, pseudocode of the algorithm. But I'm going to want to give you a very quick overview. Uh, first of all, one plus one means there is only one parent and one offspring at a time. So in each iteration, the algorithm creates only one candidate patch. Uh, it is also initialized by having an archive, and the archive save uh, uh, the best patches found so far for all the failures. And if you think about optimization, we call this the non-dominant set of found uh, patches. So the initialization start by running the existing patch with, for example, so the faulty program with the test suite. And then the, we consider, we compute all the uh, uh, failing assertions. And those assertions correspond to the search, ob search objective. And we apply a set of rules to transform every assertion in actual heuristic with a gradient, which is, for example, the distance between the car, the distance with the pedestrian, the speed compared to the limit, uh, the max speed limit. So at each iteration, then, we apply the classical uh, fault localization plus mutation. So first we locate possible uh, lines in the source code to mutate. Then the mutation is applied and we generate one single patch. And finally, the patch is executed, classically speaking, so against the original test suite. If the offspring, which is only one in this case, is better than one of the elements saved in the archive, and then the archive is updated. And if you think this in a, in a while loop, uh, time by time, the archive always consider uh, the best patches found so far. In the end, if there is a patch that satisfies all failures uh, and so uh, all the failing tests, then the archive would contain only one final patch at the end. So it's a many objective search, many uh, failure at the same time. By the end, if the patch is successful, it's only one solution that satisfy or that basically avoid all features at the end. There are two key ingredients also that we changed. So we went from a population-based genetic programming to one plus one plus archive, but also we had to change the fault localization and the mutation operators. For fault localization, as you also have seen from the previous talk, it has some important limitation. Uh, what we look at here and how to uh, make uh, the uh, heuristic with a better gradient. So if you think about the classical formula, this is one of the most popular uh, and state of the art, Tarantula, create a, compute a, a suspicious score for each statement, which is mostly proportional to the number of uh, a failing test case that cover the specific statement S. Our formula is slightly different. And in particular, the main difference is that we weight each statement with the severity of the failure. So, which means if the line is covered by a failing test, the score, the uh, relative importance of test treatment is proportional to the severity of the failure. Which means that if you have multiple failures that cover the same statement, then the suspiciousness of the statement would be higher. Or for example, if you have a statement with one single failure, but this failure is larger in intensity, also the suspiciousness score is larger. So this is the main of changes we apply in the, uh, in the formula. But also we had to change the type of uh, mutation operator to make them appropriate for our context. There are two type of uh, mutation operator we apply. The first one is the threshold. So if you think, if you remember it a bit from the uh, beginning of this presentation, it, this, um, a root set is a decision tree and every decision tree, every node in the decision tree is actually a conditional statement. For example, it verifies the distance with a with the car in front is larger than a certain uh, values. These are all the three shows that are made by legal, actually, experts and by domain experts. 
So the mutation that we apply here is to change the threshold used in the if condition of the rules. For example, increasing or decreasing the minimum distance be before taking a specific action. The second type of, of mutation we apply is the shifting condition operator. So uh, we change the order of the checks of the condition made in the actual rule set. Worth to notice, we did not apply deletion mechanism and we could not do this because the rules were actually written with uh, some constraints, mostly legal and ethical. And so we do not, did not include this uh, operator. So we then conducted an empirical study. So we have the, uh, to evaluate our approach. So we had two, uh, the benchmark is the two in the system from our industrial partner, Surf Drive 1 and Safe Drive 2. And we consider two baseline. One is genetic programming. So it's a population based, like state of the art approach. The other one is random search, which is pretty standard baseline in uh, search um, in uh, search based approaches. For the parameters, the, the main parameter about the population size apply only for genetic programming, while random search and our approach are population less. You have one minute left. Yes. Okay, no, very fast. So we set the time to 16 hours and we perform the 50 repetition. The results that we obtain on average are the ones shown in the slides. Ariel could uh, repair all um, the self-driving self one in less than 80 hours. Instead, the other two standard base, baseline could not even do with double the time. And also for self-driving two, we could uh, generate a, a successful patch in 16 hours, while the other approach could not do so even, uh, even with larger time. So our approach could repair in scenarios where basic uh, standard uh, approaches would not do it. The last part, and this is actually part we are very proud of, we could generate patches that are, um, that are basically um, test suite adequate, so all test cases passes, but we, won't, we interviewed the lead engineer from our industrial partner and uh, to actually determine if they, uh, these patches make sense. So there are three questions we look at. First of all, given a specific feature interaction failure, how they would do apply the fix, if they understand the fixes that our approach can generate. And finally, if the generated, generated patches are actually valid and can be applied. The interesting are, results are pretty, um, are pretty interesting. We found that Arial produced patches that are different from the patches that developer would, uh, would do manually. Developer mostly would add more integration rules. Our approach solved the same problem, but actually optimizing existing rules. So changing the order and changing the thresholds. But however, the developer said that our approach, so the patches that our approach generate are very valid, understandable, useful, and also optimal. And they also argue that uh, manually repairing uh, um, this type of system is pretty complicated, if not impossible, without automated assistance. And our approach is actually in place for that purpose. Last point, and this is the end of the presentation, Ariel, it's important to say, does not handle the addition of a new integration rule. So if the interaction failure uh, are uh, due to uh, missing rules, then our approach would not work uh, properly. So in summary, in this presentation, I explain uh, the problem of each interaction failure in automated driving system. And I explain also uh, some uh, important limitation on the existing program MA approaches and mostly what assumptions do not apply in this context. We proposed a new approach we called Arial, and we also find out that the results are pretty good. So our approach works in contexts where state-of-the-art approach would not work. Thank you so much. And if you have any question, please just ask. Thank you very much for a very nice uh, presentation. There are a few questions, but I'll uh, on Slack, but I read the first one and uh, I'm not sure you'll have time to respond. So you can continue the discussion after that on Slack. So the question is from Bach. Can the experts agree on the correctness of patches? And if there is any disagreement between experts evaluating the patches, what was the reason and what does it imply for the work? You have one minute to respond. Okay. Very fast. Uh, so in the survey, we provide the patch, but we also provide the simulation of the car with all the test cases to analyze if they agree. And actually during the meeting, they agree that our patch are exactly valid and actually are even better than the one they would suggest because they would add rules, but adding rules add the uh, 
potentially new feature interaction failures. So they actually prefer our solution to the one they came up with first. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sending you my applauses. And uh, please go on Slack and uh, reply to, there are a few more points that, uh, clarifications that people would uh, need from you. Thank you. All right, thanks. So now it is time to move um, to the final presentation in this session. And the presentation will be given by Thibaut Lutelier on the tool which is called Coconut. Uh, standing for combining context aware. Uh, hello? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. Oh, hi. Thank you for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Thibault Lutelier, and I'm going to present our work, Coconut, Combining Context Aware no machine translation models using Ensemble for program repair. So this work was done in collaboration with Hank Pham, Lawrence Peng, Itong Lee, and Moshi Wei from the University of Waterloo, as well as our supervisor, Professor Lin Tan from Purdue University. Manually fixing bugs is expensive, and developers spend most of their time fixing them. In fact, as of Jul July 1, 2020, there were more than 17,000 open issues in Chromium. Therefore, automation will help fixing more bugs. Traditional automatic program repair often use a generate and validate approach. Given a buggy location, existing gen generate and validate techniques build a search space using operator mutations or manually defined templates, then rank and select patches using some heuristics. Finally, each patch is validated against the test suite, and if the, if the patch passes all the test cases, it is considered plausible on the process stop. Otherwise, it is discarded and we move to the next patch. This approach has two main issues. First, a previous study found that actually in the search, the search space often does not contain the correct patch. In addition, hard-coded templates need to be adapted to work with different programming languages, which requires significant manual work. To address these challenges, neural machine translation is an, a natural approach to try. It is a deep learning approach commonly used in natural language. For example, given a sentence in French, the neural machine translation model will translate it into a semantically equivalent sentence in English. Our idea is that instead of translating French to English, we translate a buggy piece of code to a correct piece of code. Compared to traditional approaches, neural machine translation has the following two advantages. First, the fixed patterns are automatically discovered from a large training set. Therefore, the model can fix bugs. Existing approaches cannot, despite years of research or man on manually defined patterns. Second, the neural machine translation architecture is not language dependent, so it can be adapted to different programming languages without much effort. Therefore, we propose Coconut, a new technique that uses a new context-aware neural machine translation architecture. We then use an ensemble approach to combine such architecture to automatically generate fixes for very different bugs. Finally, we evaluate Coconut on six benchmarks in four different programming languages. And we found that Coconut is able to fix 509 bugs, including 309 bugs that had not been fixed by other techniques before. Here is an example of a bug that only Coconut can fix in the popular defects for the benchmark. This bug is from a real project called Mokito, and the line starting with a minus is a buggy line, while the line starting with a plus is a correct fix, which is generated by Coconut. This bug cannot be fixed by previous work because researchers and practitioners did not manually find the pattern update error type. On the other hand, Coconut can fix this bug because it infers 
this new pattern from millions of training samples mined from open source projects. This is another bug only coconut can fix. Notice that in this case, the buggy location, so still with a minus line, does not contain enough information to find the, the fix to the bug because the variable type parameter on actual type argument necessary to generate the correct fix do not appear in the buggy line. Coconut use a new context-aware deep learning architecture that represents the context of the bug and can automatically generate the complete patch by extracting meaningful information from the context of the bug, such as, in this case, the correct variable names. While neural machine translation presents several advantages, there are also many challenging challenges applying it to automatically fix bugs. In this talk, I'm going to talk about four of them. First, we'll see how we select and represent the context of a bug. Second, we'll explain how Coconut can capture the diversity of bug fixes. Third, we'll talk about a common mistake in the evaluation setup when evaluating deep learning approaches. And finally, we'll discuss the choice of the neural machine translation architecture we use. So first about selecting and representing the context of a bug. So these are two examples of bugs that have the same buggy line, return null. The correct fix is however different and it is therefore difficult for a deep learning model to generate the correct fix without information other than the buggy line. In practice, such information can be obtained by looking at the surrounding code. In the first case, the correct variable is in the body of the function. In the second one, some clues regarding the correct variable can be extracted from the method signature. Therefore, we decided to use the entire function surrounding the buggy lines as context for neural machine translation model. Now, now that we know what the context is, the second question is how to represent it and how to feed it to the neural machine translation model. So in natural language, neural machine translation takes a sentence as input, feed it to an encoder, and then a decoder generates an equivalent sentence in another language. As we just showed, applying this principle directly to program repair does not work well because the buggy line does not contain enough information to generate a fixed line. So naively, we can, just feed, we can just feed both the buggy line and its context to the encoder. However, in practice, it does not work well because the larger context overwhelms the buggy line. We address these problems by proposing a new architecture that uses two separate encoders for the buggy line and the context line. The buggy line encoder learns relationships between buggy line and fixed line, while the context encoder learns about the relation between context and fixed lines. Then, the merger layers ensure that both buggy and context encoding are treated equally, even if the buggy line is much smaller than the context. The second challenge is to capture the diversity of bug fixes. There are many, so many different types of bugs and they all have different fix patterns. For example, a buffer overflow bug is very different from an error handling issue or a null pointer exception. Therefore, it is difficult for only one model to learn all these different fix patterns. Our solution is to train multiple models with different complexity and combine them using ensemble learning. Models with different complexity will capture different features and fix different bugs. Then we use ensemble to combine these models into a technique that can fix more different bugs. The third issue I want to talk about is the danger of incorrect setup. And this is a common mistake in the evaluation setup researchers and practitioners need to be aware of when evaluating machine learning approaches. Uh, these have been described with further details for defect prediction in previous work, but 
I think we are the first to raise the awareness of this issue for automatic program repair. So the model, the model that we use in coconut are trained using data extracted from commits from open source projects. And commits are pushed by developers uh, over time. For example, here we have training instance number four from two, that uh, was pushed in 2005 and training instance number eight was pushed in 2008. So if we use this training data to train a, mo a model and then we evaluate it, for example, on the oldest bug in the defects 4 j data set, which is from 2006, then we have an incorrect setup and it's potentially biased toward the, mod the trend model. The reason is that the training instances in orange occurred after the bug under test was fixed. And such instance in practice were not available at the time of the fix and might contain information on how to fix a bug that will not be available to the model in practice. Therefore, using such instance um, in a, to train a model and evaluate it, uh, evaluating it on the defect for the data set might lead to artificially high results as described uh, in previous work for defect prediction. Uh, the solution is simple, is to train a model uh, by re but removing all the instances that occurs after the bugs in the test benchmark. This way the model does not have access to information that were added to the, pro to, um, that were pushed after uh, the bugs in the test benchmark. The last challenge I want to discuss concerns the choice of the deep learning architecture. Um, recurrent neural networks, such as LSTMs, are very common in natural language because they nicely represent the input as a sequence and read it linearly, which is somehow similar to the way people read an English sentence. However, source code is generally not read linearly and instead developers often read source code jumping from one location to another and only look at it at the, and mostly look at it at different level of granularities, focusing for example first on a variable or a statement and then looking at the global situation in a code block, etc. This is better representing, we found, by stacking convolutional layers of different kernel sizes. So I'm going to show an example. So this is an overview of our approach. Um, for simplification, I only present one encoder, but remember that our approach uh, contains two different encoders. We have the input on the left as the encoder, and then we have a decoder, an attention mechanism, and the token generation that I won't de describe here for simplicity. So here I will focus on the encoder uh, to explain at a high level why CNN layers are better in this case than RNN layers. So in these examples, we have a first convolutional layer that has a small kernel size. Therefore, um, it will encode relations between closely related tokens. For example, the first layer in pink here will um, encode relation between the token start and calendar. So this represents information at a very low level. Then we continue to add layers of different kernel size. And you can see here the third layers as a larger kernel size and which therefore encode relations between more distant tokens. And in this case, we convert the token from start to uh, uh, calendar C equal and new. Finally, we go to the fourth layer and it has an even larger kernel size. And in this case, it's actually useful in this example to encode more distant relations and can cover um, relations between the function name, Gregorian calendar, and its parameters, M time zone. So here you can see therefore, the use of CNN can encode relations at different level of granularity much more easily than that what uh, RNN layer will do. So now I'm going to present the overview of our approach. First, in the training set, we extract millions of instances from commits from open source repositories in the following format. We have a buggy line uh, with a red background, the fixed line, 
uh, in blue and the con on the context lines uh, with the purple blocks on the left. Then we tokenize these lines and tune many different models with different complexities for one epoch. Then we select the top K models and we will train them further until they converge. You will have two more minutes. Okay. In the inference stage, um, we represent how you, uh, the inference stage represent how a user will use coconut. Given a buggy line on its context, coconut will tokenize it and feed it to the K top K models. The output of this model will then be combined and ranked. Then the candidate patches will be validated against the test suite. The patches that pass all the test cases are considered plausible patches. We evaluated our coconut on six benchmarks in four different programming languages, including defects for the most popular bug repair benchmark. Uh, note that defects for has been used to test more than 22 other tools. And I want to say that for the evaluation, we also consider a patch not only fixed if it passes all the test cases, but we also manually verify that it is semantically equivalent to the developer's patch. Coconut is the first technique to fix bug in four different programming languages and is the best technique for four out of six benchmarks. In defects for project, Coconut is only the third technique be behind Tiba and Hercules, but both Tiba and Hercules use manually generating fixed patterns that were found with decades of research. Furthermore, a coconut can complement these techniques and fix six new bugs that none of the other 22 tools tested on defects for j can fix. To understand the impact of each element we used, we performed an ablation study on the defects for j dataset. First, we found that our new deep learning architecture performed significantly better than LSTM or transformer architecture when trained on the same data set. We also found that the context is used to fix six additional bugs that cannot be fixed without context. Finally, we found that using an ensemble of 10 models can double the number of bugs fixed by a single model from 22 to 44. In this talk, I present in Coconut, a new automatic program repair technique that uses ensemble to combine new CNN context aware neural machine translation architecture. Coconut can fix 509 bugs in four different programming languages, including 309 that had not been fixed before. Thank you very much for your time. I will take questions now. Great. Thank you very much for a very nice um, presentation. We have a few questions on Slack. So, Liming Zhang. Comments. Interesting idea. It seems that the approach requires perfect bug locations to get the precise context. Can we, how can we guarantee that? So that's a very good question. So in our evaluation, uh, we did the evaluation with perfect uh, localization. However, uh, we, we could use um, another fault location, location technique. Uh, such as uh, um, OCI or Tarantula um, statistical based uh, fault localization. We did not do that because we consider that the fault localization is a different um, is a different program problem in a sense that as uh, yielding showed need to also be uh, improved on can be improved with a completely different uh, approach. So what we wanted to do in this paper is really focus on the repair part and say, given perfect localization, how good can we go? And I want to add that for defect 4 j for example, uh, 12 of the technique we compared to were also using perfect localization. Um, but yes, uh, using a better fault localization approach is um, some work we need to work on on remain future work. Thank you. So Ling Ming uh, posts a follow-up question. How many patch candidates would Coconut generate for a normal defects for JBug given a basic full localization? Uh, how many patch candidates? Okay. Um, so, well, first it depends how accurate the fault localization is. Um, that's one of the limit indeed of Coconut. Um, so in the case of perfect fault localization, with 10 deep learning models, we will generate um, 
20,000 um, patch candidates that will need to be validated. So that's a lot of patches, um, but uh, it's also uh, flexible depending on your resources. Uh, so all those patch, so the patch generation is actually uh, pretty fast and can be done in a matter, we can generate like 20,000 patches within a few minutes. And the costly part is to validate them. So we can validate them depending on how much um, time you have uh, for the validation phase. Um, in fact, given perfect localization, um, we found that the median rank of the candidate of the correct candidate patch is actually four. So even if we generate a lot of patches, we would not have to validate all of them. So that's why we think it's scalable. So in the case of the incorrect, um, of a not perfect fault localization technique, um, we will generate, I suppose, um, 10,000 patches per um, loca localization, per, loca per location provided by the full localization technique, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please continue the discussion on Slack. There are more comments posted there. And uh, thank you again, all the, the speakers for very nice presentations. And we will... Uh, resume for the next session in 20 minutes. Thank you and goodbye.